Okay, we're back. We're back. Uh, Law seven. Okay. Round two. <laughs> so this is um, law seven from the Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene, which is to soften people's resistance by confirming their self-opinion. This is the law of defensiveness. Yes. Soften people's resistance by confirming their self-opinion. So, self-opinion is, Robert Greene gets into, is the what someone thinks of themselves. <laughs> and so the concept behind it is that people believe, he says that people believe that they're good-natured, that they have... Uh, he gets into good intentions. He says that they are um, self-righteous or something. Yeah, that they mm -hmm. they they know, you know, based on their ex experience, um, they are autonomous, so they do things by their own choice, and then um, intelligent. <laughs> Those are the, the what three the three things that people think of themselves, and so. So what are they again? People think that they are intelligent, good and decent, good and decent, self-righteous, and and then uh, they do things by their own choice, by which their is own autonomous. Accord. Yeah. Okay. And so, the way to soften someone's resistance, if you're trying to manipulate, persuade, convince, coerce, whatever word you want to use, this law gets into that that you you want to bring their defenses down, their walls down. And the way you do that is by uh, mirroring some of what they're saying. Uh, some of, You can also do it in the form of, by building trust, essentially. Sure. And so he opens up with Lyndon Baines Johnson. Right. Which became eventually president of the United States. Correct. But as a young person in the Senate, um, he encountered a lot of opposition at the beginning, right? Sure. He was a senator from the South, and uh, from the way they portrayed him, he was very aggressive by nature. And it says in, in a portion of the book that he had to tone down that aggressiveness because it didn't work well. And um, again, you know, um, softening people's resistance it's not a, something that potentially happens overnight. It's not a two, three day event. It could take weeks, months. And in his case, he worked at it for a year or, you know, when, when he came to look at the, a year and a half in hindsight, he had done a tremendous amount of progress to where he wanted to get to, but it took a year and a half. You know, it, you know, little by little, getting to know the people. He was very strategic. Very strategic. He would find what's called the common denominator with people. Like, for example, he would, they were talking that he didn't have any interest <clears throat> in the Civil War. But there was one senator who was a total nerd about the Civil War. So he started reading about the Civil War, and then they started talking about it. And, oh, yeah, you like that? Yes, of course. Oh, my goodness, yeah. And so you have a common denominator there. And that's how he, you know, started working on the um, defensiveness of that senator. And then, you know, that started dropping, you know? Yeah. He didn't have any interest in golf. You know, it's whatever it is that, uh, what was the other one? Baseball. Baseball. Right? And before you knew it, he was going to baseball games with his senator and they were having dinners at night together. Yeah. Now, he he had to develop some sort of actual interest, right, in these things. Or what do you think? Because he's pretending to actually really like baseball and be interested in the Civil War just to befriend this senator and eventually ask for a favor. Or do you think he actually becomes, he genuinely got in, was interested in those things? That is a tremendous question. And I think that the answer is you genuinely become interested in it as time goes on because you have no choice. He was extremely strategic. 
And he knew that to get to this particular person to persuade, let's say, let's not use manipulate, but let's say to get to this person, he had to find common ground with him. And in order to find common ground, he needed to find something that they like. In this particular case was the Civil War. So you have to immerse yourself yeah. in the full project. You need to know that the project is going to take time and you're building up to it. So you think he developed you an develop, interest? You develop an interest. You a must. genuine interest. You must. Yeah. <laughs> because if you don't, you run the risk that the person that you're dealing with can see right through you. Yeah. And then your entire plot comes apart. Yeah. Even yeah. if it was a work in process for six months or whatever, you know, it'll fall apart because they will realize, oh, well, wait a minute. You're doing this to get to this. So you have to, it's a very delicate path to take. Um, so I think that you have to genuinely become interested in it so that, okay. you know, they don't, they don't perceive you as being a fake. You mentioned that he was aggressive by nature, Lyndon yes. B. Johnson. And so he had to tone that back yes. because he realized that wasn't going to work no. in this world of politics. Correct. So another thing that he developed was the skill of listening. Yes. And he became an avid listener. Yes. And that was very difficult, I guess, for him. And it's difficult, I think, for most of us. I think for all I think of it's, us. Yeah, it's difficult. We want to share our opinion on things. It's hard to genuinely really hear the other person's view on things and let them finish their thought. We interrupt a lot. You know, a normal conversation is an exchange. So it is a back and forth like tennis. But are you really listening to the other person? I'm guilty of not at, some, at times and just wanting to oh, I say know <laughs> what I, I want to say. I'm talking to you and you're out in... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm guilty of it. It's, oh, no doubt it's about a difficult it. <laughs> thing. It's very difficult. And uh, I think it's something that one has to work at. Like it's a skill you have to develop. I totally agree. Yeah? Yeah. No, I, you know, he became what's called, like you said, an avid listener. Yeah. Okay. And you need to learn to be able to listen more. Because I think that when you're listening, it's actually when you are actually learning, you know? Correct. Um, the one thing that I find very interesting also is that along with that, they talk about in this chapter about calming down your inner voice. So let's say that you're listening to the person, but you're like a horse at the races just waiting for that person to stop talking so they open up the what is it called, the shoot, and the horse starts running out. Well, if you're just waiting for that, okay, you're missing what the other person is saying. And your inner voice is preparing you for that start. So what they're saying is, like you said, become an avid listener, but really, truly listen to the person, okay? And calm down that inner voice of yours and listen to the person. And you know, Mike, it's like with everything, um, the more you practice, yeah. The better you get. And there's been, for example, last Friday night, we went out to dinner with the family. And everybody around me was speaking. Everybody, everybody. And I found it difficult to jump into the conversation. It, you know, it doesn't happen often, right? But, and so I, I was very quiet Friday night at the dinner. Because everybody was speaking, everybody was saying something, this and that. And, you know, I felt like when I wanted to say something, by the time that I was going to say it, the point had moved on and somebody else was talking about something different. And so I just sat back there, sat back and, and listened to everybody. Um, it was easy to do um, because I felt I had nothing to apport to the conversation. Because it was changing so fast, you know, it was just, I was just, a, so, you know, um, one of the things that I do when something like that happens is I dedicate a lot of attention to the, to the kids, you know? Yeah. Um, 
but that doesn't happen to me often, but it happened last Friday. And so listening is, I think, the key to it all. And it's not just honest. listening to what the other person's saying, but also a body language, picking up the cues. So like, for example, in that situation where you want to say something and people maybe didn't notice, but if they would have noticed your body language, they maybe you sat back or whatever the case, that's part of listening too. At one point I did sit back. Yeah. And just listen. It was um, interesting. He equates it to falling in love, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So this idea of softening the other person's defenses, the only way to fall in love is that you have to be vulnerable. You have to be have your wall down. And that's what he's saying that you you want to get the other person to have to bring down their wall and their defensiveness because the concept is that everybody wants something from you. Time, money, resources, contacts, whatever. And we build up this defensiveness to protect ourselves because everybody wants something from us. So it's in our nature to have this. And the way to, when you're talking to somebody else, bring that defensiveness down is using some of these different tactics that he gets into this law. One of the things is um, understanding the other person's, the, their self-opinion what are their insecurities? So for example, if somebody is insecure about something, you don't want to touch on that topic with them potentially because it's going to bring up that defensive wall. However, one of the things is flattery. He says, you know, you could, um, if somebody is blatantly really bad at something, like playing basketball, right. we gave the example, you don't want to tell them they're good at basketball. Because <laughs> they know that that's not true. But he also gave an example of this one gentleman that was known for something, but he really loved poetry. And he liked being writing poetry. But it was like his soft spot when people would compliment his poetry. It, he loved to hear that people liked and thought he was a good poet. And so... It's finding out what makes that other person tick. Yeah. Finding a common denominator. Because, for example, you look at hobbies. Some people like to play golf. Some people like classic cars. Some people like um, whatever, right? And so if, you know, like you said, you know, if, if you find a common denominator and you get into that, then now you have something to speak with the person that, that you're trying to connect with that identifies you you know oh, you like this yeah so do i oh wow what you know like baseball or soccer you know you have a common denominator and that begins to soften that defensiveness and then you have because you have something in common that you share and then from there you take the next step I mean, you could, and that Linda B. Johnson, he gave the example, right? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. He did that. But also, it could just be flattery. It can. It could just be that you compliment the person in areas that they want to be complimented in. Right, right. Yeah, like a lot of people like compliments. So he said that, uh, in the, yeah, well, of, who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. Who doesn't like a compliment? Well, yeah. Who doesn't? Yeah. You know? But they you're say, being seen. Huh? You're being seen. Yeah. So he said that there were uh, four areas uh, to become very proficient in persuasion. Mm -hmm. And area number one, you touched on already, which was become a deep and avid listener. Mm -hmm. Talk less and listen more. You know, turn off your internal monologue. So that was the very most important one. Real quick on that, when you said like a racehorse that is just finishing for the other person to talk and then just wants to be let out the gates. Yeah. I was watching last night actually a little bit of a interview or it was a debate between someone named Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. Okay. And it was being uh, moderated. Peterson in that interview, this is six years ago, was like that racehorse. 
Sam Harris was getting off a point and trying to explain it very calm like this, you know, slower pace. And it, Peterson in his chair was like interjecting, trying to, you know, trying to go like that. He couldn't contain himself. He wanted to interrupt so much. He disagreed or had a different perspective with the other. And it looked really bad on sure. Peterson. Sure. <laughs> you know, I don't know. You know, we all have our days that maybe we're not 100%. Well, I have a great deal of respect for Jordan Peterson. And I, I think that he's one of the best minds around. However, in that interview, he wasn't listening. Right. As well. And I think he's admitted it. He he's has admitted, admitted to it. Yeah. the fact that he's a poor listener and he needs to work at it. Yeah. And see, when you get to that point, you meet people, they know so much. They've studied so much. They've read so much. They have their opinions and they want their opinions to be heard. Yeah. And so they can't contain themselves. And it looks really, really, really bad. It does. Because even if you're saying something powerful, what happens is that your body language yeah. and your emotions, I think, knock out the strength of that punch. It is. And he was maybe being completely genuine. He really wanted to react and, and being himself. However, in that stage, it in that debate, it didn't look good. In, yeah. You know comparison to Sam Harris who was very calm and sitting back but um yeah the I do give him credit for pointing that out uh Peterson has recognized that and he wants to improve at it and that's one of the things we which I'll let you we're all guilty of it by the way I'll let you finish going into those points I just wanted to bring up yeah that at the ending of this chapter what I think is the biggest takeaway here the examples are great but what is it? Is to look at into our what are our own, uh, what is he calling them? Self opinions. What are our own self opinions? Okay. And actually, like, dive into ourselves because when you're listening and you're looking to the other person, it's kind of easier to dissect. Oh, he's very. Uh, every time I bring up this topic, he's very insecure on this. He really likes to talk about himself in these areas. Blah 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 because you're observing the other person it's still something a skill that needs to be developed but to do it to yourself these are my insecurities when people bring these topics up this is how i think of myself that i think is very difficult and i don't think a lot of people do it i it personally it's, it's i don't know the last time i sat down and looked at my own like introspection I think you have to be intentional. <laughs> I think you have to be intentional. You know, and, yeah. and become aware. Yeah. Awareness is another big deal. Yeah. You know? You know, just remember that every time you point a finger at someone, you got three fingers pointing back. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. It's as simple as that. You know? Because um, when you become judge and jury, it's a problem. You know? People can talk and disagree on the topic that they're having. But I always say, hey, we can be civil about it. I don't necessarily need to be converted to your idea. And I don't necessarily need to convert you to mine. But there may be something that you say that may ring true, let's say, with me and maybe alter a little bit my perspective. Yeah. And that's what communication and conversation is all about. If you're actually listening if and, you're actually and listening. open to change new ideas. Yeah, new ideas. Um, but go ahead. You were getting well, into the Well, that was the first point. Become an avid listener. Uh, tone down your internal monologues. Um, and then he says, look, infect, infect people with the proper mood. You know, get excited about what you're going to talk about and share that it reminds me when we went to see that um uh, uh, auto mechanic place it was such a nice oh, meeting yeah and it's the first time that we ever meet this gentleman it was really good energy good energy and that's because we walked in with very good energy because of his presence on social media and we never met the guy before but to his credit he was extremely receptive of yeah. it yeah. and gave back 
you know yeah and that was really cool yeah he uh it it was it was good chemistry yeah you walk into we walk into a lot of places some places mm -hmm. it, the chemistry is off the yeah. person's not that welcoming and you know you give the person you you could try and give them the benefit of the doubt but once you go into a certain place a few times and it's the same they're just not in a good mood or whatever the case you choose if we you want to go down there. days you know we all have down days sometimes yeah. it's very difficult to sit down and do the podcast you know yeah. you have to mentally prepare yourself for it sure. and then bring in all the research that we've done and and try to do the best job possible but some days i'm i'm all for it and and uh, you know there are days where you know it's it's more challenging it's this more chapter challenging. was very difficult for it's me. very difficult i had to go over it many times because i wasn't understanding certain things um i wrote down people are always judging us and trying to take from us so we form systems of defense and become more self-absorbed that's what Robert Greene says in this chapter, he says that because of all the judgment and people trying to always take from us, we have to, it's in our human nature to defend ourselves by putting up de defensive tactics, strategies, and becoming more self-absorbed. So we just focus on what we want in ourselves and our benefit and less of caring about other people, that that's a reaction to people wanting to always take and judge us. Yeah. You know, I always say expect the unexpected. Like something that happened this morning that I'm a little disappointed with. You know, I never expected uh, this particular person to do something, mm. but they did. Yeah. And so now that changes my entire view on many things. And it's going to alter, it's going to alter the course of our path yeah one decision that this person made that without you knowing you find out about it through another source and you're saying it's going to affect the path that we take the relationship forward. and the path i think so because yeah. for example someone you know so let me put it down here i'm far from perfect I have a ton of issues, and who am I to talk about anything, okay? So I'm at the bottom of the totem pole, okay, folks? But you need to, when you're in business or in a relationship with your wife, your husband, or anywhere else with a son, a daughter, you need to be careful of your actions and even of your words because everything has an implication everything has a, a a counter effect now you can't be afraid of your own shadow either and i think that the answer is you have some ideas of what you believe in you're true to your core values and you let that shine right um but you know for example this gentleman made a move that i don't think he realizes the consequences of that particular move now i would say this is a business interaction yes okay i do think it's different than a marriage spouse friendships siblings those relationships have something called forgiveness because you care for the other person in a business setting there it doesn't exist forgiveness you can't there's no forgiveness sometimes you get one shot you messed up this person messed up in your eyes and that's it there's none of this like forgiveness so in business i think it's a lot more cutthroat and i think you do have to be extremely strategic and under and understand that this move not to be scared of your own shadow like you're no, saying no. but understand that this move will generate a ripple of consequences maybe good or maybe not and in this case not yeah and you're not going to forgive this gentleman it's not a matter of forgiving i'm not uh holding any uh, you're not going to do business with him you're not going to you're going to you're not going to potentially do business with him because of what he did right yet in a 
if it were your spouse, you would potentially forgive them. Well, I would and you're still address gonna... it. <laughs> yeah. In this particular case, in my mind, it's not even worth addressing it. Because I don't think that he realizes what he's done. Yeah. Um, you can make a move and implications could be, uh, let's say, heavy. I don't think he realizes what he's done. It's just not in his radar. You know, so, by... so I would have to go out of my way to explain and the energy and the time and everything else. You, he crossed the line. But you know what? You're right in what you're saying uh, about with family and daughters and wives and all of that because there's forgiveness involved. There's no, I'm not going to forgive this guy. It's not, it's not it's, uh, I'm uh, who am I to forgive him? It's not an issue of forgiveness. It's an issue of. But you're not even going to address it. No. Because and I and I think there, actually that was brought up in this chapter, teaching coming across as like teaching. Is one of the biggest turnoffs, and oh, we'll put up gonna... we'll put up somebody's wall. Well, in order for me to address this, it's not going to lead us into a good place. Because I'm going to address it as a form of weakness on him. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. You're and, coming as like teaching him, hey, you messed up on this. You can't. That's. It's not worth it. Not going to. That's not. That's going to do the opposite of dropping their defense, their defensiveness. That's right. <laughs> and it will. And, and this is a person that um, it's in close contact to a certain extent. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you don't want to burn that bridge. It's not worth it. No. I agree. It's not worth it. Life is short. But let me I tell agree. you something that you said. Even with family, there is a line in the sand, mm -hmm. Mike, that we should not cross. Sure. And I think that when we do cross that line, and again, what do I know about nothing, right? Then that's how you get into um, arguments, possible divorces, uh, brothers that don't talk to each other. We know plenty of them. Yeah. brothers that don't talk to each other they have businesses in the same city and they don't talk to each other okay and a lot of it has to do with uh pettiness yeah pettiness okay and not all of it is derived from money so you know way your your read the book the book will teach you <laughs> the book will teach you it's um, an excellent written book by Robert Green. Self opinions of insecurities and insecurities go back to our childhood. Do you think so? I think so. Yeah. Oh yeah. I have stuff in my childhood that um I affect sure. my way of thinking even to today. Yeah, I me too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, I brought it up in a previous podcast that I felt that I was so I'm the second the middle child. <laughs> and I was I didn't get as much attention as my older brother. And look how messed up you are. <laughs> <laughs> got a lot of issues because of it but one of the things that i noticed that would get me attention was being funny making jokes so you became so I, be joker. I became i i believe that that was part of my uh to get attention childhood traumas <laughs> not, not traumas well, but what about me i'm all messed up you know yeah, grew you get, up in a communist country in cuba we got kicked out yeah a lot of issues. in europe yeah, i mean all kinds of mess all kinds. um but you know it goes to the testament of people's experiences play a huge role in their progress Absolutely. through life. And whatever issues you've got, yeah, I think that one of the best things that a human being can do is take authority on it. Yeah, acknowledge it it's and my fault. work on it. It's my fault. Let me work on it. How do I improve this? Yeah. Because I can... Well, some Why? of the things may not be your fault if well, it's a childhood ish situation, but acknowledge, hey, I got a, this got issue. This problem. Yeah. How do I fix it? Right. I need to fix it in order to be able to move on. One of the things um, that I thought is interesting is I don't think faking interest in the other person works. And, and he gets into it, Robert Greene. He says, influence and if regarding influence and persuasion, we must immerse ourselves in the perspective of others and empathize. I agree. They're going to see you as a fake. Yeah. You can't just pretend. You can't just pretend. But you have a strategic plan and it's going to take a year, months. So you better immerse Be yourself into that and truly believe 
your your cause. Otherwise, you're not dealing with stupid people. No. It, you know, they're smart, sure. right? So they're going to see right through you. And people, it's just like a salesman that needs to sell a policy, right? Because he needs to put food on the table, but he doesn't have the client's best interest in mind. So the client will see through that. Yeah, they'll feel it. They'll feel it. Uh, in, a, in an interview, I've seen Robert Greene say, people are smarter than we think they are. Absolutely. That person that you think you've figured them out, they have a lot of other angles. They're very complex. Very complex. And that goes for children too. And I think that's a good perspective to yeah. have. Because if you think, ah, I already know that person. I kind of got it figured out. He says, being yourself is lazy. I've brought this up to you before. Being yourself is lazy. Hmm. Um, <laughs> so, I'm this way. This is how I am. Take it or leave it. No nonsense. We know these characters, right? We know people in our lives that are like that. We've even had situations where we say, hey, this is what it is. This is how I am. You know, you love me or hate me, whatever. That is being lazy, according to Robert Greene. Because you're not... And what's the antidote? The antidote is to... The antidote is to play the game. You play the game. So what does that mean? Instead of just saying, this is how I am, this is it. You, if I'm trying to persuade you, then I'm going to have you believe that I maybe agree with you with certain things. Even though I don't, I'm going to hear you out and allow myself to be convinced by you. You think, huh? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's, that's being, being, you know, this is who I am is lazy. Hmm. This is who I am is not, I mean, this is, again, if you're trying to persuade somebody to believe something, either about you or to do certain things. So, yeah, I think, I agree. I, I've met people that are like that and, um, they have no interest in it's just this is who I am. There's no it doesn't seem like there's any growth there. It doesn't seem like there's any back and forth. It's just this is it. Maybe with certain things in life we should have that draw the line. But I thought that was very interesting that he thinks that that's being lazy. Okay. That you're not willing to try and work on yourselves uh, to try and uh, obtain another so he talked about i'm just gonna throw them out there so that you know our subscribers have something to follow real quick so in order to, be, to become proficient at persuasion you need five things one you need to become a very good listener two you need to infect people with your proper mood <clears throat> three confirm their self-opinion okay like you're talking about right now number four is calm down their insecurities okay it's not that it's not that bad you feel insecure about this you know whatever i think that's in the latter stage and then number five which i thought was interesting okay and that's the, the fifth one use people's resistance and stubbornness use their resistance and their stubbornness to reach the final goal and he compared this, and I like analogies a lot, a lot, because they allow me to uh, glue on to the idea in my mind. My mind works that way. And he compared it to a um, judo fight where you're not going to, when the opponent attacks you, you're not going to block that attack gun ho. You're going to take that attack and that energy and pull him in mm -hmm. and turn him and get him into a situation where you can lock him down. But you're using his momentum, his strength, his energy to do that. And I thought that was very interesting. That was number five. He says, you use people's resistance and stubbornness to your own benefit. And see them to see if you can turn them around and see them see the light like you see it. 
you know it's very interesting yeah. you know there's just a tremendous amount of of uh, uh psychology in all this stuff oh like he says it's a job of skill and intelligence <laughs> and going a little deeper into um use people's resistance right yeah and, um, and their stubbornness the reason that people have a resistance and stubbornness it, one it could be something from childhood that they don't like authority so they don't want to be told what to do they don't want to be told you need to accomplish these tasks do things this way so they will resist to that um so what you do with people like that who are very resistant to change and many and he gets into the reason their resistance is fear of the unknown fear of change so they're gonna fight you on it and, and they're very stubborn so with people like that you by using their resistance he gives the example of um agree with their what they're doing agree with the fact that they're resisting and now they're it's going to make them question that resistance because you're actually encouraging their resistance yeah he gives the tom sawyer where he's painting and he doesn't want to be doing that but he puts it in a different light and before you know it all his friends are painting the wall for him yeah i and like giving him their fruits and everything i like the example he gave of, of it was uh from i think a movie oh yeah change or something like that where he says that there was this kid who was selling drugs in school the principal the vice principal no that wasn't the movie the movie was another one but oh, was that it? one i love that example please continue well a kid was selling drugs in school the vice principal makes him do uh kicks him out and says you have to work you have from to do home. your school work from home so the uh that's i love it he goes to has meets with a counselor and the counselor says hey look uh the reason he's doing this because the vice principal doesn't like you as a student so he knows you're gonna get worse grades and you're gonna fail and you're gonna fail because you're doing it from home he knows that so don't work as hard this semester get on his good side prove him right uh do not don't do too well this semester and get on the principal's the vice principal's good side after he tells that to the student the student then says i'm going to do the complete opposite i'm going to prove the vice principal wrong and i'm going to get good grades from home and they say that the counselor uh was actually that was their intention from the beginning to use reverse psychology on that student to make them do something what is it use people's resistance yes the resistance was to and stubbornness to get the, to the final he point. had an issue with the vice principal and he wanted to prove the vice principal wrong so he used that stubbornness in this case to accomplish what they wanted which was for the kid to do better in school that was an interesting one. Oh, i love it I but love that applies it. to employees co-workers right uh and sometimes you Business can partners. throw a catalyst in there because if the idea doesn't come to the young man let's say you could say could you imagine how everyone would laugh at the principal if you got super good grades from home it would be like taking an you know a pie and smashing it in his face because that's essentially what you've done He's putting you at home so that you can fail. Yeah. But you're going to do the opposite. You're going to succeed. You're going to give it everything you got to get the best grades possible. And that's going to be like, you're not failing. The person that's failed has actually been the principal. And yeah. you're going to prove it to the entire high school. I like that one. Oh. Reverse psychology. Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, I love that one. I like uh, examples like that, analogies. That one was fantastic so we'll we'll sum it up do you do you disagree with that being yourself is lazy what he when he gets into that or what are your thoughts on that um i don't agree with it totally okay 
But who am I to disagree with Robert Greene, right? Well, no. I mean, what's um, what's your take on it? I mean, well, not everything he says we agree things, with. There are certain things that I'm going to stick to, and th those things being my core values. Okay. Okay? And God willing, God willing, there's nothing you can do to me to change my core values, I think. Okay. You know, they're entrenched in me. It's like part of your DNA. That's what you mean by being yourself. So that is your self-opinion. Yeah, so to a certain extent. I, you're I'm, good and decent. <laughs> well, no. I'm kidding. Well, no, you have good core values. That's what you're... I, I don't... Well, I would, I would hope, <laughs> you know. You know, the idea is not to go out there and hurt someone. Yeah. But on a daily basis to go out there and improve people's lives. Yeah. You know, any way you possibly can. Have a good word of kindness to say to people because a good word of kindness creates a ripple effect that you don't know to what extent it can potentially change a day in a human being. Because there's a lot of people, man, that are struggling. There's a lot of people that are not healthy. Okay? There's a lot of people that don't see a brother or a sister for 20 years. You just don't know yeah. what people are going through. And so if you can be, and I'm not saying I'm this, okay, but like like a small beacon, beacon of light where you can go out there and you can, because it also works on your day. By trying to improve other people's lives, that energy is self-reverting, okay? And you're, you're, you end up improving your life. Yeah. Now, it takes work, people. You have to keep your mind active learn continuously try to get involved in meaningful things to you you know like the laws of the 12 rules not don't do what is expedient but do what is meaningful find your ikigai the japanese have it find your ikigai what is your reason for being what makes you tick okay you you know and then you know, one step at a time, mm -hmm. one step at a time, one day at a time. There so, are people that are so, so sick that they cannot <laughs> see six months out. You know, mm -hmm. I've talked to a couple guys and friends that, you know, they're not healthy. And when I speak with them, they say, you know what, Pablo, one day at a time. Yeah. One day at a time. So what I get so from I don't your know take that I'm being lazy. It takes a lot of work sometimes to be stand yourself in your position interesting i don't it's know it's an interesting perspective but what do i know he knows a lot more than i do he's the one that's got the no, bestsellers I, mean, <laughs> no, I think so um, i don't totally disagree with him no. yeah I, we don't agree with everything that uh, is in these books but we try to take the pieces that we that resonate with us you know there's some things that i don't agree with I'm just interested in your take. Yeah. I'm not saying that one is no, right know. or wrong. But he But I think what I get a out of seller. No, but that's not the point. What I get out of what you're saying is that in certain instances you're going to stand and to be yourself in life. And that takes energy. But it's not being lazy. Okay, that's a good point. And that's a good point. And then in other instances where you're trying to obtain something, see, you're at a different point in life when you're climbing up the ladder. Yes. You got to, in the game of politics and in a corporate setting, and you have to play the game, in my opinion. I you know, agree. You, you don't want to lose who you are as a person, so you have to be careful. Right. However, I do think these laws and understanding how to make people feel you're on their side is very important. So I think it's not in every situation are you going to do this, though. Right. But, but, I, but I agree with you. One last thing I wanted to tell you. Yeah. I said he's a bestseller. Yeah. And you said that's not the point. I'm not talking about him being a bestseller because he's earned a lot of money or anything like that. And I know you didn't mean that. But I'm no. talking about he's a bestseller, right? That means that book sold the heck out of itself, which means there's a lot of interest from a lot of people out there. Yeah. You don't become a bestseller by not bringing something extremely valuable to the table. Yeah. So there's a lot of people out there 
that value what he's put in these pages sure, sure. to have this be a bestseller. I so I can't discard his opinion completely. I just have a little different take on it because I think that's I know good that in the past, in order to maintain my stand in certain cases, it's taken a lot of energy out of me because yeah. some people don't. Yeah, it's, no, it's, I, I appreciate you know? that's why I asked you on it because I could tell you didn't agree with that. But he's writing from his experiences Correct. and his perspective, of course, and you're going to have a different view on it. And I don't think that makes it doesn't take away from him and it doesn't take away from anyone. Well, there's a lot of people that find a tremendous amount of value in what he's saying. That's why of course. He's, yeah. he's way But up. it doesn't mean everything in the book is factual or, you know, if there's... There, yeah, you can differ. You can differ. But the yeah. level of research that he does and... Um, yeah, I'm not discounting that. Yeah, you got to have a great deal of respect for the man. Um, there's a couple points I just wanted to finish okay. with. One of them was never praise talent, praise effort. Oh, okay. uh, when you praise talent, you're kind of you're taking away from the person because whether it's God given, it's just innate. You know, if if somebody is doing something very, and that's um, my eternal argument with your brother about Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. But go on. <laughs> yeah, Messi. Yeah, Messi is known for eternal. being like God given. And talent. now it's the argument with the grandkids. And Cristiano Ronaldo is effort. Because he has influenced the grandkids. <laughs> no, but what he's saying is, I, I understand that as, as so like with someone like Messi. Effort, not talent. When you're talking to someone like Messi, you're going to go less on talent. And you're going to say, look at all the hard work you've done. Because if you go on that God-given talent piece, you're taking out, you could feel like, he could feel like you're taking away from him. Um. Okay. There's a lot more to this chapter. The now, last the thing, point? the last thing I wanted to just bring up was um, the i. This is a quote from the book: "The ideal state of mind retains the flexibility of youth, along with the reasoning powers of an adult." Well, the ideal state of mind retains the flexibility of youth along with the reasoning powers of an adult. That's why I believe, he says, being yourself is lazy. You're, you're no longer, he says, as we get older, our, our mind becomes set in certain things. It's no longer flexible. Like okay. as a kid, you're flexible to new ideas and new uh, opinions of things and you don't shut yourself off. So that's that's where I think he's coming from. Okay, the ideal state of mind retains the flexibility of youth and? Along with okay. the reasoning powers of an adult. Okay. Wow. It's a great, great chapter. I mean, I'm, I'm getting a lot out of this book. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, look at that phrase alone. Yeah. I mean, Jesus. Yeah, I know that. That I mean, resonates. The ideal state of mind retains the flexibility of youth along with the reasoning power. Wow. <laughs> that's why he's Robert Greene. That's, <laughs> that's why he's a bestseller. Anything else you want to throw? No, in? it's cool. This, okay. I loved it. We'll wrap this it up. This was a hard one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was.